Good afternoon to everybody from Catalonia and welcome to the online debate towards a new paradigm for the tourism sector, the role of local entities. This is the fourth event of the Diplocat Digital Tool series that will analyze the world after COVID-19. As you might know, at Diplocat, we build bridges between Catalonia and the rest of the world. We facilitate the exchange of people, ideas, and projects. We do it with tools such as international debates like this one. The aim is, above all, to share knowledge and exchange good practices among international actors on the strategies to follow in the immediate future. An immediate future monopolized by the COVID-19 pandemic, in which the decisions made at the sub-state level will certainly have an impact in our daily lives. We observe in this context that sub-state entities, such as local governments, have had an emerging engagement, regardless of the level of decentralization of the respective countries. Their involvement in the provision of assistance, such as health or social services, has put them at the forefront of the battle against COVID-19. However, no less important will be the role from now on, given that many of them have competencies in economic, tourism, and cultural dynamics. The challenge ahead of for these and other actors is huge. This pandemic has already had strong impact on one of the most important sectors of the Catalan economy, the tourism industry which represents approximately 12% of GDP, according to data from 2018. Some more data to frame today's debate. The Barcelona airport lost around 4 million passengers last October, down by 84.7% from the same month in 2019 while there was a fall of over 90% in usual revenue from the sector. At a global level, last September, the World Tourism Organization released data warning that up to 120 million tourist jobs are at risk, with economic damage likely to exceed $1 trillion in 2020 alone. Today, we will discuss about some of the issues and challenges the tourism sector has to deal with, and at the same time, some of the opportunities arise. We will do it by sharing points of view among four very relevant speakers who, from different perspectives, will provide very interesting insights to this new and unexpected context. During this debate, the current situation of the sector and the prospects for the future will be analyzed with a special emphasis on the role that local bodies can or should play. This is the last one of our Diplocat talks this 2020. New ones around other topics will come as early as next January. So I invite you to stay tuned for next debates by following our Twitter profile, Catalonia PD, or our profile, on LinkedIn. Also, remember you can ask your questions to the panelists through the chat room on YouTube. Having said that, all that is left for me to do is to wish you a very fruitful and rich debate. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Jaume Garau, who will moderate the debate. Jaume is advisor to tourism enterprises and destinations and associate professor at the University of the Balearic Islands where he teaches the subject government in the field of tourism, tourism and environmental policy of the Master in Economics of Tourism. Jaume, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Diplocat and to Lal Forrester uh, for this kind invitation to chair this event. And as Laura Forrester has said, um, Tourism is one of the most important economic activities of the world. But not only this, tourism is a global activity. Nowadays, all cities, regions, countries want to uh, have tourism in their, in their areas. But not only this, 
I think tourism is much more important than a tourism activity, than economic, an economic activity, because tourism is means uh, in the end to meet and to know different people, places, and um, scenarios. So I think in the end, tourism is one of the most um, important experience in lives. As we all know, uh, tourism at the same time has been one of the activities more affected by the COVID-19. Is an, this is so an evidence. And this is for all these reasons that Diplocat has considered the importance to help this debate uh, today. Um, as we all know, the, the, the debate is towards a new paradigm for tourism. The debate will have two different parts. The first part is uh, a debate with four different experts, four different uh, speakers. And the second part will consist of an open debate among the speakers and also an open DA debate with the followers of the debate. So please, to all the followers of this debate, please send your questions to the, cha to the channel of YouTube, to the chat of YouTube. So then I will, uh, that's the way how you can uh, make questions and then we'll open into the, to the floor to the speakers. Who are the speakers? Uh, are for the four different experts from different institutions, they have different roles from the private and public sectors. Let me introduce all of them one by one. First, we have Andrew McEvoy. Andrew is from Australia. He's now the tourism sector head of Neom. Neom is a new impressive destination in Saudi Arabia. And Andrew has been also the chief of the tourism authority in Australia. And Andrew McEvoy, he will give us the point of view as an as a international practitioner, meaning that he will explain us how the specific policies can boost or slow down the needed changes for a new party for the tourism sector. Second, yeah, well. thank you, Mr. Second participant will be Mr. Xavier Garcia. Xavier Garcia, he's from Catalonia. He's the director of innovation at the Barcelona Hotels Association. And he will explain how the tourism business sector is dealing with the current crisis and the challenge to move to a more sustainable and greener tourism model. So thank you, Mr. Xavier Garcia, for your uh, being here today with us. Third is Mr. Ramune Gens Bigelite Venturi. He's from Lithuania. He works at the European Commission. He's now the uh, police officer of tourism at the European Commission. And she will explain to all of us, to all of us how are going to, um, to put into action the new guidelines from the European Commission. First of all, to get out, to get out from this crisis and also how to face the new multi multi um, multi-annual financial framework from the European Commission. And last but not least, obviously, Ana Sanchez. She is the director of tourism marketing at the Barcelona Provincial Council. And she will talk about the sustainable projects that nowadays the Provincial Council of Barcelona is uh, with the help of local entities is uh, are working on to get out of this crisis. To do all of, all of this, uh, as said before, I'm gonna make these four uh, different questions. Um, as a moderator, I will address three different questions. And after each question, each of you, each of the participants, you will have five minutes to answer the questions. So please keep, stay with the grid time of five minutes per participant per question. So thanks to this, all of you have the opportunity to, to interview. And also all of you, uh, we have time to, uh, to the followers to make questions. So with no more delays, let me start with the first question. And I would like Ms. Ramune Gensbigelite to Venturi to start with the first question. And the question is, 
uh, well, the most, uh, not the most relevant, but the more actual question is concerning the COVID. I would like to, answer, to ask you, to each one of you, which has been the impact of COVID-19 pandemic to tourism in your cities or region, in your case, Ms. Ramune, the view of the impact in Europe? Ramune, you have now the floor is on you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me in this uh, very timely and very interesting discussion. Uh, so from the European perspective, um, uh, of course, tourism has undergone other crises in the past, uh, the terrorism attacks, economic crisis, and it has managed uh, to recover, uh, to rebound rather well, helping also other economies uh, to recover fast. Now, today we have a very different situation. Uh, tourism is uh, literally at the halt across the Europe. The figures are, uh, are quite dramatic. I don't know if I can share uh, a few slides that I, uh, in the background while I spoke, that illustrate the situation. So uh, here we are, thank you. Um, actually, um, according to our statistics, uh, if we talk about uh, the period between February and June, so European tourism services fell by 75%. If we compare to the other services sectors or other services ecosystems, as we call, uh, the loss there was about 16.4%. Uh, uh, so the difference is huge. And you see the tourism ecosystem is significantly at the bottom uh, uh, in, in concerning the impacts and the trust um, in, in its recovery. Um, the liquidity problems are huge, especially among the SMEs. Um, many remain closed. Uh, we are calculating at least 6 million jobs at risk. Uh, out of the 2.4 million uh, travel and tourism companies we count in Europe. In the next slide, I wanted to, um, to say a, a few words on, uh, on the segments of tourism that we have here. So according again to Eurostat, our statistical office, the travel agencies and tour operators uh, have felt uh, the most impact down to 83.6%, followed by air transport, accommodations and restaurants. Um, the Commission estimates that the investment gap uh, to compensate these losses is about 161 billion euros that would be needed only in 2021. So also counting this year and uh, whatever is remaining of this year and 21. Here we're not uh, considering the, the long-term uh, investments that will be needed for the green and digital transformation. Um, the industry estimates that the recovery will take from three to four years to return to the figures of the 2019. So this time, uh, it seems that it will be, regardless of the potential and uh, the resilience of the sector, uh, the recovery will be long. Um, of course, tourism effects, uh, the effects of tourism on this crisis were not equal across the regions and countries. Um, it is important to understand the reasons uh, why some regions were more resilient than the others and draw the lessons for the future. We are working on that uh, with our colleagues uh, in, in, in the Commission for the Regional Development uh, to carry out a study precisely to find out these answers, which will be very useful for the future. Uh, the factors to consider here are, of course, that some regions rely more on tourism than the others, uh, which we all know, and uh, therefore they're more vulnerable to the, to the impacts. Um, there are destinations that rely on certain types of tourism, uh, be it seasonal tourism, day tourism, business tourism, um, na nature or rural tourism. So again, the impacts are different here. Connectivity is uh, crucial um, for tourism destinations. If we speak in particular for remote areas and islands uh, where the travel uh, by air is uh, essential. So these areas have suffered most in, in the past period. And um, the traveler's behavior, of course, uh, from the psychological point of view and economical point of view, uh, plays a very important role. Uh, the summer experience had showed us uh, that uh, the perceived destinations uh, that were safer uh, in the eyes of the traveler did better, of course, uh, largely thanks to the domestic tourism, uh, the less crowded um, destinations, mountains or sea resorts, offering uh, outdoor activities, uh, they did much better if we compare to the urban and business tourism uh, destinations. Um, what is also important here is clarity uh, when planning travel. So clear and timely information uh, on member states' restrictive measures in managing the pandemic and member states' policy to welcome the tourists in the times of uncertainty by implementing safety protocols and labels, testing versus quarantine, etc. 
as well as the coordination among uh, the member states and the regions. Um, and I can give you uh, an example in my home uh, country in, uh, in Lithuania and the Baltic states had uh, the so-called Baltic bubble uh, where they also shared uh, data and opened the borders. So um, yes, we have a very diverse situation, but in a nutshell, uh, this is the picture so far in Europe and we will see with the, with the second and third lockdown, uh, more figures to come, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ms. Ramona Gensbegilite. Uh, it's impressive, the, the figures are impressive. Uh, let's now give the floor to Mr. Andrew McEvoy. Uh, Andrew, how has been the impact of COVID-19 in your area? Sure. I'll begin, Jama, by just giving people a bit of a description of NEOM, which is where I'm working. And interestingly, there's been little or no impact here because we're not yet built. We're not a destination really yet. We're a series of projects. So NEOM is 26,000 square kilometres of land in the northwest tip of Saudi Arabia. Just above us is Jordan and across the Aqaba Gulf is Egypt. It's beautiful, incredible land with high mountains and deserts, incredible 450 kilometres of coastline, great reefs and islands. So um, I guess it's not been a destination in the past. It's almost a greenfield development opportunity that we're building out. And the bulk of our first hotels and experiences really don't come out of the ground probably till 2023 and beyond. So we haven't had a, a big impact in terms of COVID and visitation because we, we're not yet a destination. Neom actually means neo, new, and M is the Arabic word uh, mustaqbal, which means future. So it's a futuristic destination. Probably the biggest impact of COVID has been the ability for a place like this, which is only just developing now, to learn from what COVID has taught us. So Ramune made a good point that the destinations that have got space and appear to be more healthy and uh, with places for people to breathe and enjoy seem to have done better during this time, whereas the more intense urban stuff perhaps perhaps hasn't. I think the other upside, if there is such a thing as part of COVID, and I think Ramuno did a great job of describing, you know, what has happened, the doom and gloom of an industry I've been involved in for almost 30 years and love passionately and agree with something you said, Jama, which is, apart from anything else, it's a people-to-people -people industry. It's soft diplomacy. It's the way we connect. So... This is fine, but we don't want to be on computer screens forever. We want to go and touch and feel and get to know each other. The one sort of upside here in Saudi Arabia is Saudis often during um, peak periods head overseas. They spend almost 24 billion US dollars traveling out of the country. And now during this period of lockdown, there's been a lot more domestic tourism, which again, Ramon I spoke about, that they've come and discovered their own country. And in Saudi, tourism is a relatively young industry. So the very fact that 34 million Saudis have had a look in their own backyard, I think augurs well for the future. I think perhaps all over the world, uh, with no other choice, a lot of communities have come to know and love their own places. I know in Australia, where I came from, come from, I chair a company called Luxury Escapes, and we're selling as much travel as we did pre-COVID. It's just domestic travel. So it's a lower cart value, not as high value, but a lot more people doing it. In fact, a lot of destinations in Australia are full because, uh, you know, Australians who are taking 10 million trips out of the country are taking those things in their country. So I think for us at NEOM, the impact of COVID from a visitation point of view has been negligible, apart from the fact that there's this pent-up demand now, I think, and this is what we'll all be dealing with. I personally believe that if we can get on top of things with vaccines, if we can get the herd immunity stuff going, that the recovery will be V-shaped. We can see how desperately keen people are to travel again. From a neon point of view, I think we'll get a lot of learnings out of it. How we deal with health uh, as part of your travel, um, how we deal with safety, how we set standards. I think also the feeling I get from consumers is that People will treat these holidays as extremely precious. So they're gonna be picking destinations that are true to their own beliefs. So things like carbon emissions, travel miles, I think will come to the fore. And I think destinations need to really uh, pay heed to that. The final point I'd make, Jama, would be the other implication I think of the COVID crisis to tourism at the moment is that technology will come to the fore. I think 
tourism has been relatively slow in adopting technology for two ways. One is to enable more seamless travel. You know, your face as your as your passport and your way through airports. We've probably become slower and harder as a as a category, while other categories have used technology to speed things up. So I think we've got an ability to use technology much better, and we'll have to use it as well um, to make sure people are healthy and safe as they travel. But the other part of technology I think that tourism will embrace is what we're calling tech wonderment. How do we bring some of our you know, heritage and environmental things to life using technology? And I think the last sort of nine to 12 months has been thinking time where travel and tourism destinations are almost reprogramming reprogramming themselves. So that's it for me, Jamma, on this question. I think from a neon point of view, it's, it's not had an impact on numbers because we're not about that yet, but it has had a huge impact on what we've learned and how we'll build out the destination for the future. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks a lot. Very interesting. The fact that uh, Jubilee for the, the future will be more demanding in terms of sustainability and that will help to introduce faster the technologies in the case of, of tourism activity. Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Ana uh, Sanchez, uh, now is your turn. Uh, how has been the defectation in Barcelona region or area on the COVID-19? What is your impression? Good afternoon and thank you for having me in this interesting debate. I totally agree with Ramon and, and Andrew. Until the beginning of 2020, Barcelona appeared in the media as an example of city with over tourism. In a very short time, it, it changed a lot. It changed dramatically. Now the city of Barcelona has no tourists and the situation highlights how our economy activity is completely essential for the development of Barcelona. Destination Barcelona, the, the, the region I represent, has experienced the pandemic in a slightly different way. The territory which surrounds the city has more than 300 municipalities such as Sitges or Calella and areas like Penedès or Montserrat and has highly developed uh, all the tourist uh, uh, the information in, in the last year. Before the pandemic, we were developing new marketing strategies by the brand Barcelona is much more in the international markets. But due to the consequences that COVID has provoked, like the closure of international flights, like uh, Laura said before, all this expansion has stopped. Last year, more than 50% of our visitors were international tourists, and we expected a record year for the MICE tourists in Barcelona and all the area. With the start of lockdown, we were aware that for Easter, there will be no tourist activity, but the improvement of mobility restrictions around May and June in Spain allowed some hotels to remain open during the summer season, especially on the coast. Hotel occupancy did not exceed 39% in summer in the area of Barcelona. And on the contrary, it was a little bit better for rural houses and campsites, improving their occupancy figures, reaching about 42-45%. This summer, 80% of our visitors were domestic tourists. Most of, most of them choose natural environments and small accommodations with shorter stays and reducing the number of overnight stays. As Andre said before, we are just discovering our country and maybe this is not so bad. The impact of the local economy because of the fall of tourism has been very important in the area of Barcelona. A large number of companies have been hardest hit during the pandemic and they are closed now. Many workers are in a situation of ERTOs and other sectors that depend indirectly of tourism have been affected as well. However, we keep a positive attitude and we are confident with the resilience of Barcelona as a tourist brand and that figures will improve as soon as we can travel again. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, let's then think in positive. And now let's, um, let's understand now how the, from the point of view of the private sector, I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Xavier Garcia to understand how this situation, how, how has been the impact for the private sector point of view. The floor is yours, Xavier. Thank you, Jaume. And first of all, as well, I would like to thank you, Deep Rocat, for the, for the invitation. I just want to let you know, I'm going to complement a little bit what, this, what has been just said, because you all have reviewed all the situation all over, all over the world. And I'm going to talk again 
about Barcelona, just to make a differentiation, I'm going to talk about Barcelona City. Okay, before we were talking about Barcelona region, and now it's only the city. In our case, the situation, I think the best word that I could describe is devastating. As you could imagine, like hotels were all closed. So in March, when we realized that we were being forced to close in that case, it was new for us. Like we've never closed a hotel. It could be like, a little bit strange, but hotels, they don't even have a key to close the, the main door. So it was very weird for us. So they didn't know how to do it in that case. Then, as you as you can imagine, and Laura already introduced, the GDP that we that we contribute in the country, in Catalonia, it's one of the highest in the, in the region. And then out of a sudden, we had to close. So the situation by that time was more than 500 hotels were closed. We just had some of them open, but just a few hotels in the city. I could say it was about 10, 15 hotels, just as an emergency hotels, because there are some people they still needed to travel for job, for business, for I don't know, medical issues, wherever. And those hotels they need to, to remain open. But in any case, those hotels they had to send all of their employees to their homes. More than 30,000 people were at home. Most of them they weren't working at all. So it was it was pretty devastating for, for us. Then after all the lockdown, and you talk about this before, at the end of May, we could open. So the summer season for us was one of the worst ever. You were talking about figures of occupancy rates around 39%. We found out that in the city of Barcelona, the occupancy rate was the lowest ever as well, like the 10%. And the prices dropped down out to 50%. So we just had, during the summer, we just had around 75% hotels open. And this is like really, really, really bad. Just to give you an example, a normal month of August, we used to host in the city around 60, 65,000 people. Then this year we just host 3,000 people. So which is 18 times less than we used to have. At the moment, the situation is still quite complicated, it's still quite bad. Even though Christmas is coming, the situation is not, is not getting better. It's, I could say it's even getting worse than, than before. It sounds like a drama, but anyway, that's, that's the situation we have to live. Then at the moment we have, well, since we could open, we, we well, 160 hotels reopen, if I'm not wrong, I have the figures here around, yeah. 160 hotels open, and then at the moment, 50 of them had to shut down the, the, the hotel again because they cannot survive at the moment. So the situation is not the, the ideal for us. If you want the, the real numbers at the moment, we have 114 hotels open in the, in the city of Barcelona out of 500. So a lot to improve and a lot to, to do. I'm sure next year is going to be much better. So the situation could not be, could not be worse for us. Thanks a lot, uh, Xavier. It's impressive. The, the image of this dramatic situation is quite impressive. And always all these hotels um, closed down are quite impressive. Um, because of this, let's just start with the second question. And because of this situation that now Xavier was describing, we all know that many governments and even at the multilateral governments has been starting putting into place economic support and economic incentives uh, towards uh, regions and, and cities and countries. And now let's start with the second question. And what I want to understand from you, from your different point of view is, which measures has been adopted to face this crisis at local, regional, or, or both levels from economic uh, point of view, but also for a more structural point of view, for a more uh, yeah, long-term uh, point of view. And also, I would like to understand what do you expect from the European Commission in the case of the European countries, and in the case of Andrew, it's not your case, but what do you expect from, from your region in, in terms of support of the government? And even um, at the same time, I'd like to understand if this economic support that are starting now from the governments, if these economic supports are linked to the implementation of a more sustainable and greener tourism model. So I'd like to understand now for with uh, Andrew uh, to, un to start this, this question. Andrew, the floor is on you. Thanks, Jan. Look, I think one of the big things, because tourism is 
perhaps one of the only truly global industries is just cross-border coordination. And the European Union is an example. At the moment, I look around the world and every country has a slightly different rule. And, and understandably, like they're protecting, they're very domestically focused. Um, I know where I come from in Australia, they've virtually eliminated um, COVID, but they've also virtually eliminated internet, they have eliminated international tourism. So the balance has to be struck. And I'd say in the European Union, here in the Middle East, um, it's, it's going to come at different times and different rates, and that's probably understandable. But at some point, I think we need a consistent approach where there's a common uh, understanding of what a health passport looks like, a common view of people who've been vaccinated, um, a common view of the way people should travel, what they need to do. Because at the moment, I find that one of the biggest things for us all is it's confusing um, and it changes day by day. That is understandable, but at some point, assuming and hoping and praying that the vaccine has some success. We do need the UNWTO, the World Travel and Tourism Council, these all steer bodies, the European Commission, to come to some agreements so that we can have a consistent approach to tourism. We've never been great at it, um, but my great hope is that we could do that. I think the other thing, Jalma and everyone, is that um, you know airlines have really suffered and airlines are basically our oxygen. They're our lifeblood. Um, they take us to and fro. Um, they continue to improve the aircraft. They continue to be more sustainable using better fuels. Um, and I think sometimes come in for, for a lot of criticism. So, so I think we need to make sure that they keep flying and um, a lot of them will, will go to ground, have gone to ground. And anything that governments, the European Commission, anyone can actually do to stimulate aviation, I think is important. I also think there's a, there's, a, there's a visitor audience globally that will be the first ones out of this crisis, and that is the millennials and the Generation Z. I can remember when I was young enough to travel you know, at great length, and I did the, the rite of passage trip through Europe uh, back in 1991, and it was during the Gulf War. But that meant for me that prices were cheaper, and I was certainly willing to take the risk to get on a plane to go and see Europe and, and spend you know, three years away. And so I think that that market is A, probably more immune from COVID, but B, also more willing to take the risk of actually traveling and C, <laughs> look for a deal. And as a few people have mentioned, there are plenty of great deals around at the moment. They're also the lifeblood of the globe in terms of workers, because they go and they get working holiday visas and they go to countries uh, and work as well. So, so I think that the stimulus has got to be a couple of things. One is um, we need consistency. We need people to agree at the highest level. This is an important industry, employing 13% of the world and growing pre-COVID at great rates. And really, as you said in your introduction, Jalma, everyone is into this now. Everyone wants the economic benefit, but not every government steps up and says, we really want to do something to, to stimulate that. Here in Saudi, they've really worked hard, actually, during this period. They launched a cruise season. Uh, during, you know, uh, on the Red Sea um, during COVID. So it, no, it didn't have to stop. Um, you know that pre-COVID, they got a fantastic visa system allowing 49 people a visa on entry or online in, you know, 10 or 20 minutes. So I think a lot of countries have geared up during this time and I think will come out the other side really strongly. So for me, it's how do you stimulate demand? It's get consistent, get agreements, um, and also, I think there's this big audience of young people who are really adventurous that we should be incentivising, offering deals, even coupons and vouchers that I know a lot of domestic destinations have done to get people moving again. I'm not sure I've completely answered your, your multifaceted question, Jalma, but there's my observations. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, yes, yes, you answered many of the of the questions. <laughs> I, I, I take the idea of get consistency and, and agreements because in the end it is what we need more because I said before it's a global activity so we cannot go on our own one of one of ours. Um, let's continue now with Mr. Uh, Chever Garcia. What is your point of view? I mean, which has been the economic support and how do you how do you receive this? How do you take this? Well, Gemma, first of all, I would like to make an acclaration of, of what Andrew said. He was talking about millennials, and there is a word I like to use, like I always use it in this 
in these panels and it's called pandemials and you i always talk about these people they are pandemials they are those we are all pandemials at the moment we are those people that we adapt to every situation that we want to to keep traveling to keep moving and then i always say say the same example my dad he's never used a smartphone, a smartphone and now he goes to a restaurant he scans the qr he checks the menu he orders and then it's this is the, the perfect example of a, of a pandemic we, we survived to that with regards to to the questions jauma in our opinion i'm going to be a little bit critic with the with the government with the authorities in that case because i believe in a in a short and a mid term the life of our hotels is in serious danger as you as you could imagine then the measures taken by the government are not enough to, to survive yet so we are working on new on new measures we're working with them and we're trying to push and to pressure to get something else those mes those measures in our opinion need to be according to the size of the of the sector like in other countries in europe they've they've done it like a little bit better than us in that case but anyways we calculated that we would need around 450 million euros to return to to what we were before so that's quite a high amount of of money for us, what we really need from the from the authorities, it's indispensable to extend the force measure or ERTES. ERTES are the temporary employment regulations in English. Sorry, it's the it's Spanish word. We need the extension of those, which they are working on that, and I'm sure that they will extend them. But in any case, we need them at least after Easter. That is when we think or we try to to predict. I don't have like the predictions or whatever, but anyways, it's when we predict that the that the sector is going to start to to reactivate those certes those temporary employment regulations we need them to be flexible with the with the tourism sector for the same i was i was talking about our market could fluctuate like we could have a big regrowth of arrivals or a low one so we really need to put people on those regulations to take them out to take them in this is the the way we we operate and we really need we really need that from here i would like to claim for the suspension of the payment of some taxes so there are other regions out of catalonia that they've already they already did it we got the suspension of the city tax which was a little bit a help for us so we postponed the payment six months ahead and then they postponed uh, the amount of the charge that they were supposed to to increase which is really good for us in that case as well as those taxes we need also and Andrew was talking about we need like promotion and communication we need to let people know that Barcelona is still going on the city is leaving people go out they go for a drink they go for a coffee they go shopping they go to museums so we need to promote that through the wall everybody knows the situation but they need to know that people here we, we used to do this and we're still doing it I truly believe that the European funds are focused on solving those problems. But as I mentioned before, at the moment on the hotelier sector, we don't need like mid long term solutions. We need short term solutions. So the funds are, are not enough for us. And then, well, in any case, the, the funds for sure, they are going to be a push to the to the hotel in order to move to a digital transformation or to a more sustainable sector. But at the moment, we need solutions to survive. And then after that, we could become a, a more sustainable sector. Thanks a lot, Xavier. You just mentioned uh, measures according the size and the importance of the, of the sector. That's a very interesting uh, point. Exactly. Um, no, no, Ms. Ramune, uh, thanks God that you are here because many questions uh, for the European Commission. Um, the economic support of the European Commission, uh, Ramune, how is, how is this? How is going to be? How is the situation? Uh, what is how is the what is the size of this economic support? Uh, you mentioned before that it should be or, or more than 160 billion of, of euros. The economic impact of the, of the sector. How is how is dealing all this uh, from the point of view of the European Commission? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, we have received, of course, uh, at the very outset of the of the pandemic, a lot of criticism. Uh, it was a shock to everybody. We've never had a situation like this. And you have to consider that um, the EU mechanism is, is heavy. We're 27 member states. 
uh, many competences are not in the hands of the Commission, uh, so we need a close coordination with the member states of giving us the right to move ahead. So having this in mind, in parentheses, uh, we must say that we have mobilized a really unprecedented level of support uh, to face the crisis for the European economy, and I'm talking about European economy, tourism included, because tourism was recognized uh, indeed everywhere as one of the most impacted sectors. Uh, what we have done, first of all, uh, we have provided a lifeline to save jobs and, and, uh, and businesses by, uh, for example, allowing the flexibility to reallocate the remaining unused uh, regional funds, 37 billion of euros, to support health system and uh, to support at the, side, at the same time businesses the most uh, affected in the member states. So some countries I see here, Italy, Portugal, France, Poland, for instance, chose to support tourism SMEs directly uh, by developing the services or assets for tourism. Uh, not everybody chose that because uh, in some countries these funds were already exhausted uh, in other priorities or simply they had other, other preferences. We have unlocked the flexibility under the temporary state aid framework to allow member states to help their businesses on the ground. And this has been quite a success uh, because we, we count nearly 270 uh, national and regional support streams across the member states. Uh, some of them are targeting tourism directly, others are multi-sectorial, of course, uh, from big companies, so airlines, uh, you know that some airlines have received uh, big state aids, and also small, that is very important to help the small and uh, medium enterprises here. Uh, we know that Spain has launched a number of, of these schemes, and um, it's interesting to hear, and, and, and I'm a bit sad to, to see that uh, in Barcelona, for instance, the hotels have not really seen this, uh, this support yet and we're not happy uh, at the moment. Um, what else we've done? We have a sure uh, instrument, which is indeed targeting um, uh, what you mentioned here, uh, the short uh, time work schemes, either existing or the new ones, so the companies can safeguard jobs. Um, the second point is very important, and it was mentioned here already by, uh, uh, by the previous speakers, is uh, the coordination. The coordination among the member states in Europe has been crucial crucial uh, because uh, obviously uh, without it uh, we couldn't have uh, achieved what we have uh, until now um, to make a travel and tourism possible again at the same time in a safe and secure manner. Uh, this has given uh, we believe and we hope the confidence to the citizens uh, at least uh, we have seen the results in the summer period. Uh, so, for example, since May, uh, we have uh, um, launched the communication on travel and tourism, which was basically um, a framework uh, for hygiene and safety protocols for tourism establishments and for all modes of transport. This has given a harmonized approach uh, possibility for, for the member states to adopt. Um, moreover, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and the European Union Aviation Safety Engine Agency have jointly issued uh, the COVID aviation health safety protocol. And most recently, the guidelines for the COVID uh, testing and quarantine of air travelers. We are working with the member states uh, to improve the use of common criteria and exchange of essential data regarding public health and travel. Already in June, we launched um, a web platform. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, Reopening You. Now it's also a mobile application. Um, it provides a real-time information to travelers, uh, helping to plan uh, the holidays. Uh, and already we see about uh, 8 million people today have used this, uh, this application, which is encouraging. We have developed um, a framework um, to make national uh, contact uh, tracing apps, applications interoperable across the countries. And we will launch soon in the coming weeks, a EU digital passenger locator. Third, uh, the most important, uh, probably, um, to support all, all these uh, initiatives and ideas is the financial means. So following the agreement, finally, and by the heads of state last week, we are equipped uh, with the financial means to help rebuild the uh, post-COVID Europe. Actually, we have um, the largest stimulus package ever financed by the EU, uh, which amounts to 1.8 uh, trillion to relaunch the economy and, of course, at the same time, to move to, uh, to a different uh, sustainable and digital future. Uh, Spain, uh, as far as I know, will benefit uh, from 140 billion from the next generation EU. So we have here 126.3 billion from Recovery Resilience Facility, which is uh, the core 
of the next generation EU and 12.4 uh, billion from React EU, uh, which also supports um, tourism uh, among the other most affected um, areas. Um, and this is in addition, of course, to, to the support that will be available under the cohesion policy and other uh, programs for the, for the coming uh, seven years. Um, the recovery uh, should be, of course, future oriented, uh, built on the green and digital transition, aiming at economic and, and social resilience. Um, and here it's important to emphasize that um, the budget that was just adopted, um, there we have at least 30% uh, of the money going uh, to the climate action and 50% to support modernization. So this is important to keep in mind and let's hope that we keep up to this ambition. Uh, while for tourism, uh, we've been criticized quite a lot here, uh, there is no dedicated budget line under the multi-annual uh, financial framework, but it has been again uh, recognized as the, the sector most affected by the crisis with a strong potential uh, to help uh, recover the economies. Uh, for instance, we have a European regional fund uh, regulation, which was amended precisely for this reason after the crisis to include tourism. So uh, tourism has more visibility here. React EU, as I already mentioned, also singles out supported tourism. So there is some progress in that respect. Um, but of course, it's all in the hands now of the member states. Uh, there is a lot of money, but uh, depending on the strategies they design at the national level, and tourism, let's be honest, will not be always uh, the priority in every region, in every country. Um, it can benefit already from today, uh, to, from, the, from the money allocated. Um, now we intend to prepare a guide uh, for, the, for the industry, for the destinations and administrations to, to find its way in this uh, labyrinth of, of, um, of uh, funds and instruments uh, now that it's been adopted, that we have uh, the, the, legal, um, uh, the legal agreement, it will come. So we hope this will be helpful. In a nutshell, we have a unique opportunity uh, to make the smart use of the available funds and to restart tourism. Uh, so it is more resilient, uh, more sustainable, uh, more innovative and more digital. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Ms. Ramune. It's, it's, not, uh, it's always very interesting to, to understand and to hear the, the EU response because sometimes from part of, as member states, we cannot even understand sometimes the, the complexity of, I'm, I'm sure it's not easy at all to coordinate all the member states. At the same time, we are not always aware that this is the largest financial support for, for, for a sector or for, a, for, the, for economy. But always, it's always been a problem, at least in Spain, that the lack of transparency when reached the national level. I mean, when EU funds reach at the national level, and then, for example, in Catalonia, we don't have the, any kind of transparency or information of how then Madrid will decide or will allocate the, the money amongst, amongst different uh, parts of Spain. But that's another debate, but just to put, put, put you in the, in the picture. Mm -hmm. Ana Maria, uh, Ana Sanchez, uh, you are also part of the of the government of uh, Barcelona. So let's understand now uh, the point of view of the region of, of Barcelona. Sorry. Yes, uh, Diputación de Barcelona started different measures right at the beginning of the crisis, like uh, because, as you said, we had a very big impact, and especially on the coast of Barcelona. On the one side, the, um, sorry, on the one side, the marketing side, we created the zero strategy. Zero because it was absolutely new for everyone and we can have any uh, precedents uh, to, to learn about. We began a series of marketing measures to support the tourist sector, such as webinars, workshops, and information, and also inspirational campaigns with our tour operators and media and social networks and the aim to, to complement all the things that the, the sector, the, the private sector were doing. On the other side, on the economic side, we created shock plans to support the city's councils of uh, the province of Barcelona, mainly addressed at the small and medium-sized companies and freelance workers. The total amount of these plans is about only 20 million euros, but they complement those offered by the central government and Generalitat de Catalunya. We are aware of the need to reach the smallest companies in our territory, perhaps the most affected by this pandemic, 
and therefore through local councils we can send these aids directly to these companies. Regarding to the European funds at Diputación de Barcelona, we are designing a project to support companies based on the criteria set by European uh, network, as Ramon said, and we hope to be able to share it soon with the Generalitat de Catalonia and the Spanish government, because we agree that inst institutional coordination is crucial and we are committed to this European recovery plan. Referring to the issue of sustainable tourism, we hope that these funds will help us to take an even faster and more determined step towards this change of model we are already started some years ago. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thanks a lot. Um, it's always, I mean, it's the, the, the region of the debate is to have now the opportunity to compare different point of views, Barcelona, mm -hmm. European Commission, even Australia. Um, now, uh, let's start with the, for the last question of, the, of this debate of today, uh, which for me is the, my, my favorite question, <laughs> is, um, is regarding the future. I mean, let's imagine in a, in a six months, in six, in six months, in a year, let's just, let's just speak about the future, uh, tourism after the pandemic. Um, what would you expect after the uh, after COVID-19 crisis? I mean, how is gonna be the, the tourism? Uh, question for all of you. I mean, is the future leading towards a greener and a more sustainable tourism model? Because for me, this is one of the key questions. I mean, yeah. because some of you mentioned, I think was, was Anna, that we, we, we went from, from over tourism to no tourism. Okay. Are we going to have again from now from no tourism to over tourism? Um, no. <laughs> so this is the, the key issue. And let's start now uh, with you, Anna. Um, mm -hmm. How do you foresee the, the tourism after COVID? Is it going to be possible to have a, a greener and more sustainable tourism? Yeah, we, we are absolutely committed to the sustainable and responsible tourism. We started with this path in, in 2017 when we started the Biosphere Certification by Diputación de Barcelona and we achieved the Biosphere Gold Certification last year. And we realized the need to implement this procedure, not just for us, but also to work together with our destination, with the local and, 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 and the middle-sized destination, and also directly with the companies. And nowadays we have more than 500 companies with a biosphere commitment in our region, in, in the city of Barcelona and the region of Barcelona. And this number has been increasing even during COVID-19, so the companies know the importance of, of uh, developing this kind of commitment and, and this working together for this responsible uh, tourism. The crisis has shown us how important is also the local customer for the future marketing campaigns. As I said, the zero strategy was addressed directly for, for our resident to our local uh, tourist. And from now on, we have to rethink uh, all of our actions of promotion and also to take into account the benefits, but also the cost of, of carrying uh, international customers to our destination. And we have to, to do it uh, just to have a, a better destination to live and a better destination to visit. In these difficult times, uh, the local tourists has allowed it to develop new products, new way of visiting things, new possibilities for segmentation. It was really a change of mind. The marketing as we do uh, last year is impossible to do it now. And we have to do this new marketing with uh, sustainability and all with new criteria like digitalization and, and, and thinking about this new customer. So, we have to change our mind. We have to start from zero again, and we have to rethink our tourism. And this tourism must be greener, absolutely. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thanks a lot. Uh, now is the turn of uh, Ms. Ramune. Um, how is the how the Com European Commission foresees the the future of the tourism after uh, COVID? Are we going to the a more sustainable and with less uh, a greener tourism? Hmm. Well, uh, what a tourism will be like? It's a question of a million. <laughs> We've heard a lot of uh, 
a lot of ideas uh, from, from the seminars that I've been attending. Some are more optimistic, uh, saying yes, of course, will be more sustainable, more digital, and it's proving already. Others have been more skeptical, saying that, well, the over-tourism will still exist, we will want to recover the economic losses, so we will see. We are constantly talking to the, to the stakeholders, to the industry, to the member states and regions. Um, let's see. Uh, certainly for us, uh, tourism should be more sustainable. Uh, why? Because, uh, of course, first of all, we have a commitment. We have a commitment uh, with the European Green Deal uh, and a promise to the future generations to deliver a uh, climate neutral Europe. And tourism is, uh, is committed there as well, we hope. And we want to see. Uh, second of all, because we already have a lot of good examples uh, implementing sustainable tourism, a lot of uh, good examples implementing uh, digital tools for tourism to be more sustainable. So we are hopeful and we are optimistic. Um, we need a clear sense of direction here, uh, not only financial tools, and uh, to, to, to have a clear vision with the clear actions uh, on the table at the European level. For this reason, in October, uh, Commissioner Breton hosted the European Tourism Convention uh, in October uh, 13 uh, to launch a debate, to launch a debate uh, in order to achieve this uh, vision and clear actions for the tourism of tomorrow in Europe. Uh, we had um, an impressive number of, uh, of uh, stakeholders who attended. And um, it's good to know that we have a consensus. So uh, there is a clear consensus that the twin transition, digital and green, is a key uh, for sustainable recovery and for the long-term competitiveness of tourism. It cannot be uh, business as usual. This is a starting point. Um, and uh, now indeed is the moment to direct the sufficient support uh, that I presented uh, in the financial terms to this recovery. We must think of the needs of the companies from the very small ones to the largest and the needs of the destinations. So from the most remote uh, to the busiest hotspots as well. We cannot leave anybody behind in this, uh, in this process. Uh, and everybody will need to take uh, the role um, to transition uh, if you want to see a tourism changing in the next years. We need uh, to help people working in the industry and destinations uh, by equipping them with the skills and capacities they need uh, for the future, uh, for the future tourism to be resilient. We are working on the Pact on Skills that will be launched very soon, uh, where tourism will be also covered. So basically it's a, a pact between public and, um, uh, and private uh, bodies to, uh, to work on the skills for tourism, uh, in particular green, digital, uh, also crisis management and preparedness skills. Uh, finally, we need to empower local communities so they don't feel as um, a sacrifice, their life beings, uh, their, their well-being is not sacrificed uh, for the sake of tourism, but they actually indeed benefit from the, from the value that tourism brings. To achieve this, we need the right governance tools to be in place. And here, uh, the role of regional and local authorities is central. Um, you are the voice uh, of the local communities, uh, so you know the needs of the community, uh, the potential of the area to develop and to grow, the challenges and the opportunities of the tourism businesses, you know the concrete investments and support that is needed, and uh, within your reach you already have, I'm sure, a big pool of ideas and best practice uh, projects that can be shared and implemented. So this is the contribution, uh, the way I see uh, from the regions and local authorities. Um, some ideas, it's important to highlight uh, projects uh, can be implemented at the local level, but many others can be achieved by cooperating across the regions. And you know that at the European level, we put a lot of emphasis because we see uh, a lot of good results when the cooperation across the region happens. Uh, for instance, in the climate uh, resilience area, in sharing data and intelligence, uh, or creating cross-regional products and services have been quite successful ideas. Now, uh, Commission supports member states in every way, in every step. We are helping now already uh, on the draft uh, recovery plans and the long-term programs that are already submitted by the member states. So here again, in parentheses, I encourage local and regional authorities, please uh, be in connection with your, with your capital, with your central uh, managing authorities to make sure you are on board. And this is very important. And we emphasize with the member states all the time that uh, stakeholders and uh, all bodies should be on board uh, when designing such important strategies and plans. 
um, in the last months, the Commission uh, delivered uh, important initiatives that will enable travel uh, and tourism ecosystem to achieve this transformation. So I would mention a European Climate Pact, a Sustainable and Smart Mobility Strategy, uh, and just yesterday we have adopted European Data Governance Act and Digital Service Act, uh, which will set the new rules for digital platforms taking, uh, we're playing quite an important role uh, in tourism, as we know. Next year, uh, we plan to roll out an update of the industrial strategy. And tourism is one of the ecosystems in this industrial strategy uh, highlighted. Uh, well, why we need the update? Because of the post-COVID reality. We need to reinforce our vision and our tools. We also plan, as I mentioned, uh, to, uh, to present the Pact for Skills uh, on tourism uh, in the shape of uh, well, public and private partnerships to upskill and reskill uh, the works. The, the people working there. So uh, despite the disruption brought by, by the COVID pandemic, um, uh, again, I want to emphasize that we have a unique opportunity uh, to transform European tourism and the commission is ready to, to help and to take action, uh, but we cannot act alone. So we count on your support in this, uh, on your ideas, but also uh, by sharing your concerns and, and critical uh, well, criticism, where we can do more, how we can help more. This is very important if we want to achieve something. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ms. Ramune. So the European Commission is, is ready. We have the European Union Green Deal. Um, let's now give the floor to Xavier Garcia because Sometimes has been this little bit of controversy between the role of the private sector and the, the role of the public institutions or concerning the sustainability greener. Let's, let's see what is your point of view. We are in the making, Gemma. And yeah, the, the answer, I think it's yes. I, the answer of the question is, I believe it's yes. Not because of the people's minds changed due to the, the pandemic. I think it's just a, a fact of it has to be like this because we won't receive that many flights. So Andrew was talking about that before. So we don't have the same amount of, of people in the city. So then the, the way of traveling is changing. We've seen Anna also talk about that. People is trying to, to travel more locally in, at the moment instead of going overseas. And then I think this is the, the matter that it's gonna make us change a little bit and to go a little bit more, more sustainable. They were talking about the, the over tourism here in Barcelona. We suffered a lot of campaigns against hotels, against the, the over tourism we, we used to have in the city. And it's not only because of hotels, it's because of the whole sector, I believe. We try to work a lot on that. We truly believe that hotels are not the problem. We could even be a, a, a solution for, for the city. And at the moment, talking about new implementations, new integrations to, to move on a, on a more sustainable tourism model, hotels are looking forward to implement new tools. They are looking for projects to develop, to become more sustainable places. So they really want to be open to, to the neighbors. They want to work for the people in the city. Hotels are not just for tourists. Hotels are for everyone. And they really invest a lot on, on that. Um, I really think now it's time for, for entrepreneurs who have like really good ideas to, to take a step forward and to go on with new projects with, with hotels here in, in Barcelona and also all, all over the world. Here in Barcelona, we, we've seen a huge increase in like creating new hubs in the, in the city. From the Barcelona Hotels Associations, we were aware that, they, that there were a very traditional sector. We are like very stuck in time. From the big revolution of the of the OTAs at the moment, like when those booking.coms, Expedias appeared, it has not been like a huge transformation on the on the travel sector focused on, on hotels. Airlines are another world, they are a few years away from us. So I'm talking about, about hotels. And for that reason, from the Barcelona Hotel Association, we decided to create the what we call the Travel Innovation Hub. So from the Travel Innovation Hub, what we are trying to create. It's like a huge community where we put together SMEs, startups, investors, so they can all meet, they can all know each other, they can create synergies, they can create like joint projects to develop like a better city. And all of them has to be focused on a, on a more sustainable way. So in that case, like the, the Travel Innovation Hub, what tries to do is to accompany those subsectors in the tourism sector. Let's talk about travel agencies and hotels because we are the ones that 
were a little, a little bit more, more stuck in time. We try to accompany them on their on their digital transformation. So we try to do it on this on this more greener way. Some projects that we are working on or the, that we have worked on and we have still pending to implement it's all over the world are, are some of them. But here in Barcelona, we are trying to create a, a data smart destination so we can control the flow, the tourist flows all over the all over the city, also inside of the hotels. We want to know or we could know where the tourist moves around the hotel, how many people do we have in the swimming pool at the moment. So I guess if you don't want to go to the swimming pool now, maybe you could go to the, I don't know, to the museum, to, to a museum, then come back later on, because it's going to be a little bit less people in the in the pool, just, a, just as an example. We are working with some companies in order to develop like smart and smart energy efficiency systems. We also created, we are trying to do of Barcelona 5G laboratories. So hotels in the city are working for that as well. They are providing their spaces in order to test the, the 5G technology. And that's it. We are from the association, we are trying to push hotels in that case to, to move on this on this greener way. Thanks a lot, Xavier. It's it's um... Very interesting to hear that also the private sector is working on this to have less crowded destinations because sometimes we have the impression that at least in the Mediterranean destinations are overcrowded and over uh, commercialized. Yeah, if you if you allow me to make a, a point of this, Jama, what we always try to defend is not the problem is not the hotels, maybe the problems are the illegal short-term rentals that are popping up all over the world. Then that could be a factor of the of the over tourism in, in that case. I didn't want it to go into the topic because it could be also another debate as we were talking before about politics. This could be another one. Great, great. Um, Andrew, you are working in a, in a new destination that is building right now. And one of the most important goals of this destination is to, have, to, to be the, one of the first 100% sustainable destination in the world. So in here, in this question, your answer is very, I have a lot of expectations to, to, to learn from, from you. The floor is Thanks, Jama. Yeah, Jama knows it well for those watching because Jama uh, was a pioneer here at Neom and was a part of the start of the journey. Vision 2030, which is the Crown Prince's vision for Saudi, is certainly one that's a sustainable future. So a lot of this was being done, as we all know, pre-COVID. I think COVID has just exacerbated it because we haven't been able to travel. But even before COVID, I think that the number is 8% of global CO2 emissions were generated by our sector. Um, and over tourism was a, a dirty word that was coming in and we we're all having to defend. My point would be that volume, once we recover, will be big and it will grow. We won't stop volume. I think between 2000 and 2018, the number of people traveling the world in that 18 year period doubled. Why? Asia has emerged, you know, it's a burgeoning uh, middle-class economy with the time, the money and the wherewithal to go. This region, the Middle East, similarly, and then there's all the mature markets of the Americas, Europe, et cetera. And Africa is still to come, India is growing massively. So I don't think we're gonna get away from volume. What I do think is that, and, and I think Javier made some great points around technology. I think technology and, and energy uh, advancement will be our friends. So to Jana's point here at NEOM, the energy sector is very focused on uh, hydrogen, very focused on wind, solar, um, and, and very focused on um, proper desalination where we don't just create water, but we use the brine for things as well. So sort of like a circular economy, how do we begin and end even construction so that it can go back into the ground? So here at NEOM, 26, thousand square kilometers, we'll only develop less than 5% of it physically. And the, the rest of it will be things like natural parks, um, nature reserves, um, marine reserves. The reefs here are beautiful and untouched because not a lot of people have lived here. They've been overfished, but we'll replenish that. We're looking to rewild some of these natural areas. So bring back the animals that populated this place previously, the ibex, the oryx, um, I think even things like the, the leopard and the cheetah, the ostrich. So bringing it back to its natural state, the regrowth, 
um, the flowing of the waterways, the wadis, which are really magnificent and beautiful. So I think this is where destinations like Neon perhaps have a bit of an advantage. It's not turning the ship around, it's beginning as we mean to go on. It's knowing what the world is looking for. The other part I think to being green is people still want great holidays. They wanna have fun. They want to enjoy life. They want sun and sea. It's still the biggest way that people, you know, what people do. So, you know, Spain, I think, is in a good place when it comes to that. It won't stop. But I do think people also want to be healthy and active. So I think the other thing that's happening as a big focus here at NEOM is we want to sort of uh, leave home, have a break and come back with true respite. So the other part of not just sustainability is things like wellness, um, mindfulness, and I think this is something that the tourism industry is embracing to a limited extent. We've got a lot of spa resorts and that sort of thing, but I think it's probably a bit deeper, even spiritual. So I think this stuff, and the final one for me would be in the post-COVID environment, apart from sustainable, being mindful, I think people want to learn something on their break. I think the days of coaster buses with people with flags taking you and telling you basic information are fast diminishing. And I think technology can give you deeper, better stories about what you're seeing. I know myself that if I leave having been immersed, having met someone local who can tell me the story of the locale, um, having learned something or having a story to tell other people, I feel better about that holiday. So I think post-COVID is not just sustainability. I think volume will be there. It's gonna be at how we manage it. And I think things like energy, technology, mindfulness, and I think, um, you know, the way we tell stories is going to be essential. So, again, Jama, I hope that's okay for an answer. But, you know, as you said, NEOM it will begin as it means to go on. We don't have the legacy of being a destination. So we can think this stuff through. And we're certainly committed, as you said, to being sort of 100% carbon free. But beyond that, how do you replenish? How do you rewild? How do you actually make it a better place than when you found it? Thank you very much, Andrew. Very, very interesting. Um, well, uh, I've learned a lot from all of you. I'm really enjoying the different point of views from all, all of you. Let's just start now with the second part of the um, of this seminar because we still have uh, around 15 to 20 minutes. Um, now it's it's turn to to start the, um, the discussion among, among us, and I just make a reminder to the followers. So please, any followers who wants to make a question, just please use the chat through the YouTube channel uh, so we can uh, um, hear and listen your, your questions. Mm, but we have already now two questions. Um, one is specifically for, for Ramune, and the other is, it's just, I think it would say it's for, for all, of, all of us. First of all, we have a question from Emilia Canaro who is asking if, uh, when we, we do believe that the tourism industry will start recovering its employees, and if we have any estimation on the timeline of the recovery regarding the employment rate ratio. I know it's a very specific question, but I don't know if any of you have any answer or any scenarios or any estimations for the short term future regarding employment ratios or, or employees? Because I think this is one of the most uh, questions that is on the mind of people who is working from this sector. Any of you has any kind of estimation, a scenario, or any answer on, on this? Jair? I can take that, Jalma, from the hotel's perspective. In the city of Barcelona, what we've seen, we are gonna be over the 50% of occupancy rate in July. That's what we have predicted at the moment. We're in a very changeable situation, so we don't really know. Maybe tomorrow I'm going to tell you, no, not in July, it's going to be in October. We don't really know. But at the moment, the facts are we are over 50% occupancy in July. It also makes sense because in July is when we, when we are going to have, like when we are going to host the Mobile World Congress, the ESA, so it makes sense. Okay, interesting, interesting. Jama, can I add to that? Um, Please. I do think that companies will... Unfortunately, out of any crisis, they right-size themselves. As I said, I'm the chairman of a, a major travel company. And th during that period, they had uh, people who were stood down, but on a thing called JobKeeper in Australia, and that kept it going. But as we come back, the great people are coming back at, at a good rate, but we probably won't be as big. 
So I do think, and I think Javier's point's good, as things come back, people will get re-employed. That's terrific. But I just get this feeling that we might be 10 or 20% less people in our sector for the next two or three years. Judging by the number of applicants we get to come and perhaps work at NEOM, I know there's so many great people out there now looking for a gig. So it just happens post the global financial crisis, people just right size tighten the belts a bit. So I think maybe we can recover to 90% and we'll take time to get to the 100 plus percent in my view. Okay, okay, thank you. Any ideas from European Commission or from Barcelona region? Mm -hmm. Um, if I may say, uh, it's, it's, no, it's impossible at this stage to give a number. Uh, uh, when precisely? Because uh, there are a lot of unknowns. I mean, we are hopeful with the vaccine. We are hopeful uh, that the measures will, uh, will take off and uh, I mean, we're optimistic. I mean, uh, we, what we've seen also um, uh, on a negative trend is that many employed people in, in the tourism, they have left elsewhere. Uh, where they can work with the digital skills um, in, an, in another, other sector. So this is a loss. We, we, we witness in some cases a loss of the talent. This is sad. Um, it depends a lot also on, uh, on the national or regional actions. So this cushioning funding to keep the, the employment, to keep the talents, you know, uh, and, not, and not allowing them to, to, to go away from tourism, that is very important. Uh, so besides that, um, what is also uh, crucial and what will influence the employment, of course, is the demand uh, from the tourists, from the consumers. What we're doing at the EU, uh, we're doing surveys, uh, we're doing, um, uh, let's say, um, assessments of what are the expectations by the travelers in the coming months, because at the moment we can foresee that. There is some optimism. Uh, now I'm seeing something that is still not published, but will be published in the coming week. Um, European Travel Commission has made uh, uh, travel preferences of Europe uh, winter holidays assessment. Uh, I see that uh, during the winter, for instance, there, are, there, are, there is quite some increase, uh, some optimism. Even for the city break, which is interesting for Barcelona, 19% would, uh, would foresee a city break, considering the situation today. 17% uh, foresee nature and outdoors, others foresee cultural and heritage. So um, it's hard to see. I mean, we work step by step, but it's, it's, a, complex, um, it's a complex picture. It depends on, uh, in many ways on the local and national actions. Uh, and it depends on, uh, obviously, on the health situation and how it will take off. Uh, and on a coordination among the member states from the perspective of the EU. Mm. Thank you, Rune. Anna, Sanjay? Yes, uh, I, I totally agree. Unfortunately, some companies will die, will die in this in this uh, future time. But but maybe it was meant to be in the near future. Some of these companies will die in in two years, in three years, and this crisis just make it sooner. So. Uh, I think we can work together, as, as Ramona said, to, to, to develop new companies, to develop new talent, to keep it on the tourist sector and to find new companies because we will have new customers, new needs. So we have to think in the future, some companies will die, but we, we must be together and, and create new companies addressed to, to this new consumer. Yeah. Okay, agreed. Um, we have another question. Um, well, it's not an easy question, I'm just telling you. Um, it's uh, from Norbert Bess from the Girona province and Costa Brava Tourist Board. They have a tourist board in this area of Catalonia, Girona province and Costa Brava. And they want to understand that having in mind that the EU funds from next generation will be a key at the midterm to support uh, the recovery of the tourist sector, having in mind this, they are making the question of how the European Commission could help in removing all the administrative barriers for SMEs. I know it's a very, uh, it's the key of the issue. Uh, maybe not only Ramon can answer this, maybe you have some ideas from Barcelona Association or even from uh, Barcelona province, but uh, this is an issue. I mean, how we can help all this immense, uh, all administrative bureaucratic uh, barriers. Any answer, Ramone, Ms. Ramone? It's a complicated question and it is probably one of the biggest um, objectives we're striving at the EU. You know, we have the new um, strategy for the SMEs. 
at the European uh, level, which is precisely to, to help to remove the unnecessary, uh, unnecessary barriers at the EU level. Uh, when it comes uh, to the to the bigger industries and um, and um, uh, associations, um, if you link this to the to the financing uh, or the if I understand correctly the question, the access to finances, right? Uh, the, I know that SMEs often have these difficulties, so it's about um, it's about the the information arriving timely and correct information on where and how the financing could help uh, these SMEs to, to overcome the challenges. Uh, this is something that is again uh, in the hands of the member states. Um, at, from the EU perspective, what we have done, we have uh, provided a lot of flexibility in this financial perspective. Um, we have uh, changed the rules in the sense that um, a member state decides where is uh, the priority to invest. Uh, if the situation changes, you can change uh, through, the, through the different topics and areas. Um, so the administrative burden, I think, from our side has been reduced as much as possible, keeping in mind, of course, the necessity to be, to be accountable. But this is the financial uh, part. Uh, other barriers, legislative barriers, um, I think we are working at the EU level on different fronts. I mean, tourism is a cross, is, is cross-cutting um, uh, subject and it's difficult uh, to, to summarize uh, in, in this answer. But um, I think there are, there are initiatives in place that will help to, to achieve this. Let's, let's hope so. Um, Ana Sanchez, Xavier, uh, well, Andrew, in your case, you are open, but feel free. But I don't know if Ana or Xavier any I was taking notes, Joma, so I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, I'm sorry, but I don't have it. Sorry. It's an issue. It's an issue. Gemma, it's a global issue, you know, red tape. And I think, and I'm, I think uh, Ramona sounds fantastic. I think most governments almost act like they need to intervene when they don't. You know, it, there's always talk about one stop shops. I think it's a fair question, and it's a constant frustration not just for tourism, but for any small business in most governments. I mean, here in Saudi, they're trying to strip everything out, make it quicker and simpler. One of the tenets of NEOM, it'll have its own founding laws and regulations. And we're working on those at the moment. And we're actually learning from the complexity that's been created in places like Europe and the Americas and other places and trying to strip it out. And to Ramuno's point, it's hard because you do have to protect the, the, the consumer. You do have to have you know laws and regulation standards. But how can you do it in a, a simpler way? I just think sometimes even the language that's used, um, the archaic technology that's not used. So I think it's a common issue. Uh, certainly Saudi and particularly NEOM is looking to streamline all of this stuff so that small to medium sized enterprises want to actually locate here. So this is gonna be a competitive advantage for destinations. We need to get it sorted. Okay, I agree. Um, now we are in the very last part of the of the debate. I don't know if some of you want to have any questions to regard to other colleagues or any thing you want to stress out. Uh, if not, I have a, a question for you. But before doing it, let's. If any of you wants to have any questions, any something to to stress or. I have a I question. Want to know what I, can, I want to no, know what sorry. I can come to Barcelona. Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Ramune, she also have a question. No, my question is, um, how do you see uh, Barcelona, but also other destinations, Baleares, coming out um, from, you know, learning from the past uh, mistakes of uh, over-tourism or mass tourism? I mean, we've been all reflecting about this. Uh, do you have a magic answer to that? Do you have some concrete measures that uh, have been uh, maybe on the table already to, to implement in the coming years? May, if may I answer? Um, th there's no uh, a key for that, but but Diputación de Barcelona with the, the, the municipality of Barcelona and also the Chamber of Commerce, we began the start with the, with this uh, process of, of uh, commitment with sustainability some years ago uh, to change so this over tourism in Barcelona and in the area of Barcelona. So we think that that the key must be this this responsible tourism that the putting the client in the center of all the marketing campaign and not to have 
any customer, but the customer we want and the customer who wants to come to Barcelona and to stay here and to have a long visit, a, a calm and a slow tourism in our area, not to check the, the touristic spots and, and to enjoy uh, visiting us. Uh, so we want this, this tourist that wants to be a Barcelonian, Barcelonian and, and to enjoy the Mediterranean life in our city and region. So we are preparing this plan called Destination Barcelona to, uh, to, to do some activities and marketing campaigns all over the world with the city and the region and to spread the tourism from the city to all the region in order to, to have more sustainability. So you are very welcome to come to Barcelona anytime you want. <laughs> You have availability all over the, the hotels in the city and you. Now I want to complement the, the answer of Anne as well. Like we talked about before, but technology is also helping us. We are trying to, to take profit of this technology. We are making of, of Bar not only Barcelona, also like the Diputación is doing a, a really good work to, to include all the regions around Barcelona to put them, to make them a little bit smarter. And then we know like if you want to go to the beach and Barcelona is full, go northern to Badalona or go southern to Sitges. So that's what we what we know. If you want to go to the mountain and Tibidabo, it's completely full, go to Montseny because it's half an hour drive from Barcelona and it's beautiful and it's, it's amazing. So they're doing a really good job with this. The hotels were trying to join them and then we, we will do so as well. I think there's a bit of an answer there on what Javier said in that geolocation and tourism tracker can say to people there's better places to go than the one you're in now. Not everyone will take the advice. I think it's going to be tough in the key locations. It's just about management. But I agree with Javier. I think technology could be our real friend here to actually give people an indication of what's available. Disney does it now in their theme parks where your RFID or your wristband and also they've got a thing called Face Pass will buzz and if you've given them your details it'll say I see you've been in that queue for 30 minutes there's a much shorter queue at XYZ right over the park or um, Javier you don't look happy in the queue can I give you a free ice cream why don't you take a break so they're trying to actually manage the visitor experience and I think Javier's point of that technology is a really good one. Okay um, thank you um, well, in my case just one of my fears Ms. Ramona is that in 10 years time, that we, we, we haven't learned anything from this situation. I mean, I can imagine a situation where in Balearic Islands, for example, we receive 16 million tourism in a very small destination. And in our case, even I fully agree with Xavier and Andrew that technology is an asset and that it can help us. In our case, we are an island. So we are, technology can help us, but we are in the island. So I think also, I think, you know, destinations like Venice, for example, or Mallorca, or, that, well, I think it's about the time to start putting certain maximum, certain limits like is happening right now in, in a museum or in, uh, in certain areas or like a beach, because if not, uh, it's, it's, it's a problem. My major fear is that in, in 10 years time, we haven't learned anything in, in, certain, in certain areas of, of, the, of the world. Anyway, this is our last uh, two minutes. I don't know if any, any more questions? Uh, they are asking me, one of the participants, one of the followers, if we can have the presentation of Ms. Ramune, we can have it available uh, so we can share into the participants or into the floor after, after this. And yes, that's, yes. that. okay, you can confirm this? Yes, yes, you can share it. Okay, there are some links that might be helpful also for, for inspiration of the best practice we have collected uh, for the sustainable uh, uh, actions. I think it would be helpful there. That's super and uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention now we talked about over tourism, uh, maybe it will be interesting also for you. We are launching in the beginning of next year, we should sign a contract uh, end of this year with the consortia a study on over tourism together uh, with a platform, a platform, uh, well, in the form of discussions, uh, workshops, hopefully, uh, with the stakeholders on this topic. Uh, so our goal is to understand, in particular, the aspects that have not been addressed uh, sufficiently, such as social media, for instance, or, or other influencing factors to over tourism, and uh, to see maybe we can identify some risk assessment benchmarks, you know, how to see uh, when is the limit, where is this limit for over tourism for those uh, destinations that are suffering, but also for those that would like to 
uh, well to, um, to predict a little bit their development. So I hope this dialogue will be useful for you as well in the future. And we do hope that we will have some answers and some uh, good practice share. Sure. So uh, now is time. Uh, thank you to all of you. I, I really uh, learned and enjoy. I hope all the followers the, the same. I only have now one request, one request to Deep Locat and to Laura Forrester that next time, as Andrew was mentioned, next time let's, let's touch and feel. So let's ask Deep Locat in a, in a few months time, we can repeat again this, but live, I mean, meaning that in, in Barcelona, why not? <laughs> so and we can uh, continue learn experience and learn from each other. Um, so to all of you, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, for your invitation. Thank you, thank you, Jaume. Thank you to all the speakers. And of course, if the uh, pandemic uh, allows us, uh, we can do that, certainly. We will be happy <laughs> to do that and share it with you all, of course. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.